Well, good morning and happy Sabbath to my brothers and sisters in Moline, Galesburg, Savannah, and Sauk Valley. Uh, today I want to share with you uh, a message that is uh, stirring, stirs my soul, uh, and I pray that you are blessed, are going to be blessed and touched as well. Hey, does anybody here know uh, who uh, Terry Burroughs is? Terry Burroughs. Well, don't worry, I didn't know who he was either. He's from the United Kingdom, and in 2009, October 9th, 2009, he set the world record for window cleaning. What they do is they set up three 45 by, by inch by 45 inch uh, windows in their frames and uh, they time how long someone can clean those three, three windows. Guess how long it took him? It took him 9.14 seconds. That means it was about 3.04 seconds per window. Can you do something that fast? Terry Burroughs. I want to talk today about a, another cleaning job uh, that is going on. It hasn't taken nine seconds. No, it's going to take a lot longer than that. And it's not just one person who is doing this. It is a team of people that are doing it. And it's not windows that are being cleaned. It is a much deeper, bigger mess. A mess that has affected the whole world, affected uh, all of humanity, affected you and affected me as well. The mess called sin. Today I want to take a look at this. All heaven is on a mission. Let's turn our Bibles to the Gospel of John chapter 1. The Gospel of John chapter 1. We're doing a, a journey with Jesus and we're looking here now at the second day after he came back from the wilderness of temptation uh, and the experiences that he went through. Uh, let's go to John chapter 1 verses 29. Through 34. John chapter 1, verses 29 through 34. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who is preferred before me, for he was before me. I did not know him, but that he should be revealed to Israel. Therefore, I came baptizing with water. And John, that is John the Baptist, bore witness, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and he remained upon him. And I did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, Upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and testified that this is the Son of God. So this is, as I said, the second day after Jesus came back from the wilderness of temptation. You remember what happened the previous day. Uh, in our last sermon, we took a look at that. John the Baptist was interrogated by Levites and by priests sent from the Pharisees uh, from Jerusalem and asked him, who are you? Are you Elijah? Are you the prophet? Prophet, Are you that Christ? And John answered no to all of them. And so they, they challenged him. They confronted him and said, why are you baptizing then? If you're not one of these these people, what do you say of yourself? And so uh, John told them that there stands one among them uh, who they do not know who is greater than him. John clearly said to them that the Messiah is in your midst. Well, the Levites and the priests and everybody else there looked around and they saw nobody in the crowd which looked like one that would be the Messiah. Now the Levites and the priests obviously dismissed John and just went back uh, to those who sent them that they may give the answer that they got. These delegates did not follow up with John the Baptist. They did not ask him, who is this one that is greater that you're referring to? Who is this Messiah that you're referring to? Show us. Give us understanding. If they had done that, then they would have been uh, telling the people that this John the Baptist knows more than they do, that he is following the work of God closer than they did. And so they dismissed it, and they went back to Jerusalem. But as a result of their dismissal, as a result of their refusal to follow up, as a result of their departure, they missed out on a great opportunity they missed out on this day two testimony of John the Baptist. They missed out 
on a great revelation of the nature of the Messiah and the nature of his kingdom. Jim was a man who uh, shared the word of God with me while I was working in IT department. He was in the engineering department, and he shared with me as he tried to share Christ with others. There was one man in particular, and he gave him an, a, a pamphlet from Amazing Facts uh, to read. The man was curious, and he gave him the pamphlet to read. But when Jim went by his desk later on that day, he noticed that the pamphlet was face down. This man didn't want anybody to know what pamphlet he was reading, what the material was, what the content was, what the subject was. Uh, he was a little uh, concerned, or I guess you can say uh, obsessed, with how he was viewed by his colleagues in the office. And I've seen that myself, that uh, those who uh, want to know Jesus and do not care what others uh, we'll think about that, have that pamphlet face up. But those who are a little self-conscious have that pamphlet face down. But the Levites and the priest here that interrogated John on the previous day are a warning to us. If we are moved more by what others think of us than what God thinks of us, then we're going to lose out as well. We are going to miss out on great revelations. We're not going to see the nature of Christ and the nature of his kingdom, we are not going to see that all of heaven is on a mission. Behold, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. This, John is, gives us, encapsulates, this gives us succinctly what heaven's mission is. Not just the mission of the Son of God, but as we're going to see, the mission of of the Father, and of the Holy Spirit as well. John referred to Jesus as a lamb. Uh, and this, in a sense, is encapsulated. This resonates with what we read in Isaiah 53. This proclamation uh, spoke to or repeated what we read in Isaiah 53. The arm of the Lord was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised. For our iniquities, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter. There is the Lamb of God. We make his soul an offering for sin. My righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Notice the connection uh, between what John the Baptist said about Jesus, the Lamb, and what we read about in Isaiah. Now this is interesting to note because John, like the rest of Israel, was not expecting a suffering Messiah, but a conquering Messiah. John the Baptist himself thought that Christ, yes, was coming to establish a kingdom of right and righteousness. He was coming to establish a kingdom in which all hypocrisy is going to be purged. But he thought as well that he was coming to establish a political and or military kingdom as well. This idea of the Messiah suffering was new to John the Baptist. He was under inspiration as he spoke it, but he himself did not understand this revelation. And this has happened so often among the prophets of God. They are given a vision. They are given a revelation. They are told to share it. They may have an idea about this, but our hindsight shows us that they did not understand it themselves. The disciples were told to proclaim the kingdom of God is at hand, but they had a false idea. They had a mis misperception regarding that kingdom. What they were preaching was true, but their understanding of it was not. And this has happened throughout history as well. Jesus the Lamb. The Lamb was used in the Passover uh, service when the children of Israel were still slaves in Egypt. On the day of their deliverance, God had them eat the Passover lamb and sprinkle the blood on the doorway so that the angel who will slay the firstborn would pass over their house. But what John the Baptist is referring to here, or what was more captured uh, by Jesus as a lamb, is found in the sacrificial system in the book of Leviticus. Let's look at that real quick for a moment. Please notice, uh, as we go through Leviticus chapter 4, it's going to talk about different sin offerings. For example, if you're the anointed priest and you sin, you bring a bull for a sin offering. If, you, if all the children of Israel sin, they're to do the same. 
They are to bring a bull. If you're one of the leaders, one of the rulers, one of the judges in Israel, then you don't bring a bull, you bring a male goat. Uh, or if you're one of the common people, you bring a female goat or a lamb. So here's where it's important to note. Jesus is referred to as the lamb by John the Baptist. And this points out to us, what this says to us, is that Jesus was going to be a sacrifice for the common people. Yes, he was to be a common a sacrifice uh, for any priest. Yes, he was to be a sacrifice for all of Israel. Yes, he was going to be a sacrifice for a leader. But by being referred to as a lamb, what we are shown here is that his sacrifice was going to be all-inclusive for the common people as well. But the lamb means more than just a sacrifice. Notice what we're told in Leviticus chapter 4, verse 32. If he brings a lamb as his sin offering, he shall bring a female how? Without blemish. Without blemish. So yes, Christ represents as the lamb of God is to be the sacrifice for the sin, but he's also to be, uh, he's also, the lamb also represents an exemplary and meritorious life. The lamb was to be without blemish, so too Jesus was going to live a life which would be without sin. A righteous life, my righteous servant, God referred to him in Isaiah 53. A life which would show us what righteousness looks like. What a life without blemish looks like. John the Baptist said, behold the lamb. He said, behold the lamb of God. This is important to note. God was going to provide this lamb, this sacrifice for us. This echoes what Abraham told his son Isaac. Abraham was told to bring his son up to Mount Moriah and sacrifice him as a burnt offering. But Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, My father, and he said, Here I am, my son. Then he said, Look, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. This is precious to note. God will provide for himself a lamb. God looked down on this pitiful earth. God looked down on this sin-sick, crime-ridden earth. And he saw among us and there was none. None of us could provide this lamb. None of us can provide this offering. We did not have the equipment in and of ourselves to provide these things. God saw that we could not provide it. God provided it himself. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away, John the Baptist said, takes away the sin. And while he refers to sin here in the singular, suggesting that he is not talking about sin as an act here, but he's talking about sin as an all-encompassing principle. I remember when uh, I was all ready one morning to gobble up a, some strawberries in a, in a package, but I opened it up and I saw that one of the strawberries had fungus on it. It was a nice big strawberry. I said, oh, bum, I'm not going to be able to eat that one. But as I took it out, I saw that that, mung, that fungus, that mold, spread to each and every strawberry. Sherry and I learned recently when I'm done with a peanut butter jar, uh, I don't want to wash it out right away. I'm going to soak it in water for a while. I'm going to put water in it and let the water kind of take the peanut butter off of the jar itself. But we learned that if I keep that peanut butter jar open and the water uh, in it, then the, then the sponge for the dishes just a few feet away begins to grow mold on it as well. These things show us. These things are an allegory for us, or an analogy for us, of the impact that sin has in the human race. It is a corrupting principle. It is a paralyzing principle. It has affected every fiber of our being. It has affected every aspect of our life. It started with one man and went throughout the entire human race. Romans 5, verse 12, Paul tells us, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world and death through sin, and thus death spread through all men. 
When Adam sinned, he became a sinner. When Adam sinned, we became sinners. When Adam sinned, he fell. His humanity became corrupt. And when Adam sinned, we fell with him or in him, and we were born corrupt. Sinners can only give birth to sinners. And so sin pervaded the entire human race. Sin pervaded the entire world as well. So when John the Baptist referred to Jesus as the Lamb of God, which will take away the sin, he is talking about every aspect of sin, every being or every bit of sin. There is a penalty for sin. The wages of sin is death. Jesus paid that penalty. There is a power of sin. When we commit wrong, we are enslaved to that wrong, except it, to be, except it be for God's intervention. Jesus, by His grace, empowers us and delivers us from sin. There is a penalty of sin. There is a power of sin. And there is a presence of sin. As we read the news today, as we listen to the news today, it is clear, it is evident, we are living in a sin-sick world. We are living in a world of chaos. We are living in a world where every day, every moment, every corner is influenced by sin, is, has sin presiding over it. Jesus came to deliver us from the presence of sin. The day will come when you and I will be in a world will be an environment where there is not one trace of sin. Behold, John said, the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world, not just his people, not just God's church, not just those who have faith, but John, John tells us that Jesus is going to take away the sin of the world, the sin of all humanity, the sin of this planet. Now, I want to make it clear that what John is not saying is that everyone is going to be saved. That's not what he's saying here. But when Jesus went to the cross, he died for every transgression that was ever committed, from Adam to the last human being uh, that will be here on earth before Christ comes again. He died for every one of those sins. Let me go further. Someone might ask, why then... Are there going to be those who are going to be lost if Jesus is going to take away the sin of the world? And let me share with you why that is. If we refuse Jesus Christ as our Savior, then what's going to condemn us is not our transgressions, our wrong acts, but what's going to condemn us is our refusal to accept Jesus Christ. What's going to what's, what is going to condemn us is our rejection of the gift that God has given to us in Jesus. I will not be condemned or lost because of my transgressions of the Ten Commandments. I will be lost because I did not receive Jesus as my Lord and as my Savior. And so when sin is eliminated from this world, those who clung to it, those who embraced it, those who held on to it, and, receive, and rejected the gift of Jesus Christ so that they may be delivered from that, they are going to perish with it. So the day will come when all sin will be eliminated and those who cleave, cleave to it will be eliminated as well. Brothers and sisters, let us accept Jesus as our Savior. Let us embrace Him. Let us take hold of Him. Let us open the heart and let Him in. Let us as the Old Testament patriarchs did with the Lamb. Let us place our hands on Him and confess every sin and ask for forgiveness and take the assurance. Have the, let, let us have the assurance of the promise that is ours that we will be forgiven. Jesus came as the Lamb. The Father sent Him to us as the Lamb. All of heaven is on a mission. Not just the Father, and not just the Son. Let's continue in the Gospel again. John chapter 1, let's read again verse 32. John chapter 1, verse 32. And John bore witness, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a what? Like a dove. And he remained on him. Here we have the picture of the Spirit's involvement. We saw this when we looked at the baptism of Jesus, you had the Father, you had the Son, you had the Spirit, all were involved 
in the baptism of Jesus. But now we see that all of them, in a sense, are part of this ongoing mission. This is the Spirit's involvement. Notice how did the Spirit manifest itself as a dove. Now, taking in conjunction uh, with what John uh, with, with what John said about Jesus as the Lamb of God, we might get a further insight into this. Again, from the book of Leviticus, chapter 5, verse 7, we are told, if he is not able to bring a lamb, that is, if, if uh, you come to bring a sin offering before God and you cannot afford a lamb, then he shall bring to the Lord for his trespass, which he has committed, to what? To turtle doves or two young pigeons as a sin offering and the other as a burnt offering. So please note what this is saying here. Those who could not afford the lamb, those who did not have the resources they needed to bring the lamb, God said you can bring two doves instead. Turtle doves and doves are the same in the Septuagint, in the Greek version of the Old Testament. This is important to note. The spirit that rests upon Jesus inspired him to sacrifice for the sin of the world. The spirit that, that fell upon Jesus also inspired him to be all-inclusive. Not just for those who could afford the lamb, not just for those who could afford the bull, not just for those who could afford the goat, but for those who can only afford the dove as well. The dove represented Jesus' all-inclusive ministry. He came for the rich, yes. He came for the eloquent in speech, yes. He came for those who were high, had high influence, great influence uh, in all the world, yes. But he came also for you. He came also for me. He came for those of us who, do not, who cannot boast of any resources. Jesus' ministry was all-inclusive. That spirit uh, showed, manifested himself as a dove to represent that Jesus was going to open his arms for every single human being. And notice what John the Baptist said. John bore witness, verse 32, saying, I saw the spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and he remained upon him. Remained upon him. I remember, I can't remember what year it was, maybe... 2013, 2014, not sure, but I was, I was practicing, I was training to run my first marathon. And so there's this particular park or particular track in Springfield, uh, which was a good, oh, maybe 25 miles round trip. And so I was building up Sunday morning by Sunday morning. I was going to do five mile round trip or six mile round trip, even number only, uh, eight mile, 10 mile. And I was building it up. And I did an 18-mile run, nonstop. I said, dude, I did it, I did it. Now, a, a marathon is 26 miles, okay? So I had still more to go. But, oh, man, I paid for that 18-mile run. I paid for it. And when I stepped back uh, and thought about that, I said, oh, man, should I do this? And if part of me was saying, do it, do it, keep, keep practicing, keep practicing. But... I'll admit to you, I lost my zeal, and I stopped practicing after that fallout from the 18-mile run. Brothers and sisters, I'm so glad that Jesus is not like this, that he does not give up. The Spirit came upon him and remained upon him. And throughout his life, throughout his ministry, Jesus continued the spirit of sacrifice. Throughout his ministry, Jesus manifested and revealed the spirit of all-inclusiveness. He that comes to me, he said, I will in no wise cast out. Those who came to Jesus looking for help, those who came to Jesus looking for mercy, those who came to Jesus seeking for hope, he ministered to each and every one of them. And his life was a life of continual giving. The spirit like a dove rested on him or came upon him and remained on him. All heaven is on a mission.
you've heard that phrase sometimes that silence at times speaks louder than words. Notice how the account of this second day ends. John the Baptist still speaking, verse 34, and I have seen and testified that this is the Son of God. That's how day two ends. The second day after Jesus came back from the wilderness. The gospel is silent in regard to the response of the disciples of John the Baptist. They heard him the previous day say that the Messiah is in our midst. And now they see their teacher, the one they look up to, the one that they believe is a prophet sent from God, and rightly so, they see their teacher point to a particular man and say, this is the one, this is the one. And yet there's no record of any of the disciples of John following this Lamb of God. They believed, and rightly so, that the Baptist was sent by God. But this Jesus, who can this be? Notice what we're told in the book Desire of Ages. To the multitude, however, it seemed impossible that the one designated by John should be associated with their lofty anticipations. Thus, many were disappointed and greatly perplexed. Among John's disciples, when they looked upon the man that Jesus pointed to, none of them jumped on him and said, let me follow this Messiah. But no, as they looked upon him, as they looked upon this Jesus, they said, how can this be? He is not what I expected the Messiah to look like. And none of them followed him the first days. Some of the disciples of John and some of those in the crowd who were looking for the Messiah outright dismissed this Jesus of Nazareth. But there are others who were confused, others who were perplexed, and they went to God that night in prayer and pleaded with him for understanding. Lord, I am convinced that you sent John the Baptist. I know that this is your messenger and that he came to prepare the way for the Messiah. But the man that he is pointing to, how can this be? Lord, help me. Those who dismissed this revelation from John the Baptist lost on a great opportunity. But those who earnestly prayed, those who sincerely prayed, those who with their whole heart prayed, were later called and were given the privilege to be part of the mission of Jesus. And all of us have that opportunity today. When Jesus manifests himself to us, we may not recognize it. We may question it. We may wonder. But if we honestly plead with God for understanding, when we are willing and ready to give up all our preconceptions that run contrary to the word of God, we too will be called. And the mission of heaven will be our mission as well. All heaven is on a mission. Brothers and sisters, just this week we reached a milestone in the United States for deaths from the coronavirus. We reached 100,000 and we're exceeding that right now. As we look at our world today, as we look at our society today, we see more and more chaos because of this pandemic. So many are suffering financially. Because of this pandemic, so many more are suffering emotionally. Psychologists have reported that they've had to bump up their medications, their prescriptions, twice the normal levels. Because of this pandemic, children are isolated in homes where there is, there's domestic violence going on. Children and mothers. Because of this pandemic, people are anxious and wondering what is going to take place. People are discovering that their, their riches or the possessions that they had, the position that they had, can be lost in, the, in a moment. Because of this pandemic, you have people who are taking advantage of others and seeking to draw what they can during this time, uh, what they can to enrich themselves. My friends, my brothers, my sisters, God wants to bring this all to an end. 
Jesus came as the Lamb of God. He sent Jesus as the Lamb to take away the sin of the world. He has paid the penalty. He is ready and eager to free us from the power, but he is longing even more so to take us away from the presence of these things. If we make the choice today to join Jesus in this mission, how much sooner we can see this all end. I appeal to you, all heaven is on a mission. Let us join all of heaven in this mission. This is my prayer and my hope for each of us in Jesus' name.